Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the second part of the second module, module 2. Uh, we were discussing about categorization as a fundamental mental process. We have already seen that categorization is a process that is at the core of often the thought processes and on the language um, output, linguistic output and how it is the categorization as a process that creates concepts. So, basically this is at the root of conceptualization. So, con and we have uh, from that uh, point we have this we have talked about the conceptual categorization as a process and how, what is the outcome of those processes. And we have also seen that uh, through various theories of uh, categorization through the classical theory of categorization and then we went on to uh, look at the prototype theory and the exemplar theory uh, with the with the help of uh, color terms and so on. While discussing color terms, we have seen that languages in the world differ in terms of the number of basic color terms they may have. It ranges from 2 to 11. So, there are languages uh, which has only 2 color term and on the other hand there are languages that has 11 color terms. All the other languages are um, in the middle of these 2 um, extreme points on the spectrum. Now, the question is if a language does not have the uh, names that is the codes for the chromatic uh, colors. What does this mean? Does it mean that they will have only one particular focal color? So, if in case of Dani it is Mola and Mili, um, do they have similar kind of focal colors or are there possibilities of differences and so on. And Roche has shown us that even there, even if you ask different speakers of the language about the focal color. So, what is a representative color of Mola? There are differences across speakers. So, uh, through this we have seen that the theory of prototypicality holds in, in case of color terms. Another important um, aspect of color terms and their possible relationship with cognition itself in terms of color cognition uh, has, also been ex has also, also been explored. So, if a language has very small number of basic color terms, does it limit our possibilities to understand and learn about languages and talk about languages in any way. This was the other strand of uh, research that was carried out by Roche and her group and it turns out that it does not. Limitation in uh, numbers of terms for the law for the colors does not really mean limitation in terms of your capability to either identify or to learn the names. So, Roche actually conducted studies in this community and succeeded in um, teaching them both basic and non basic color terms. So, if that if the language had a limiting factor this would not have been possible. So, this means that color cognition does not depend on color terms. Now, why are we talking about color cognition depending on color terms? Because we already um, know that there is a very uh, important uh, theoretical position taken by Sapir and Wolf and their followers which is called linguistic relativity that says that the language that we speak, the structure of the language, the semantic structure of the language actually has a strong impact on the way we slice up the universe in the sense that the way we look at the universe, the way we understand the universe, cognize the uh, world around us is dependent on the language. So, it is in this context that the Dani's um, understanding of color terms, their color cognition is understood is uh, looked at from the perspective of the 
terms of color that they have. So, we already know that sapir Bhav hypothesis talks about this kind of a relationship between language uh, we speak and the way we think. Now, it has two, two versions as we uh, will see the strong version of the um, hypothesis says that language determines the way we think. So, it has a deterministic um, uh, role that we have that uh, language has. So, this is the strong version very very strong um, claim that the language we speak decides this this is the the only glass through which we uh, look at the world however there is a weaker version of the theory as well it says which says that language may not really decide the way we look at the world but it certainly has an influence on the way we think so these are the two versions of sapir bhav hypothesis now Keeping this in the background, if we look at the color terms and the co color cognition in various communities, we would uh, see that if the strong version were true, it would be next to impossible to learn a new second language, a second language that has a different way of looking at the world. For example, a Dani would not be able to, Dani speaker will not be able to learn English and English color terms if a strong sapir of hypothesis is to be true because his color cognition has been already decided, it is already determined by the words that his language offers, which is only a, a two way differentiation. So, that way it will be and it, uh, it will be imprisoned our un understanding, our cognition, our um, entire mental mechanism would be imprisoned very, very limited by the language. However, this is not the case, Dani was Dani uh, Roche was capable of able to make them learn the English uh, some of the uh, non basic and basic color terms. Okay, so, the strong version is not tenable, what about the weaker version? Weaker version does not claim that language decides the way we think, weaker version claims that there is a relationship, there is an amount of give and take, there is an amount of influence. Now, though research in many domains have uh, actually refuted the strong hypothesis, there is actually a new uh, wave of research that has that is happening for last uh, some time that actually has some amount of proof in support of the weaker version. So, there is a uh, some amount of proof of interaction of course, this is rem remember this is a, um, a more more uh, objective way of looking at this at the at the relationship this is about interaction not about deciding. So, there is an uh, impact of the language that we speak on the way we think apparently. So, there is the, there is uh, an amount of research that has given us this this um, info new information. So, new research on language cognition interface have brought the relativity issue back to the forefront, because relativity uh, the entire debate about relativity was um, sidelined after Chomsky's innateness hypothesis uh, became a very strong uh, theoretical position and it was no, no more tenable. However, this, uh, this idea this relationship has been uh, recently brought into the foreground. And this actually has happened after the cognitive revolution, after many um, you know, newer way of probing uh, human cognition and the relationship with language and so on came into being. There are um, many, many um, uh, points of departure, one important uh, domain, one important um, uh, uh, field of linguistics that has looked into this issue in, a, in detail is that of cognitive linguistics. Simultaneously also bilingualism research in last few decades has brought certain very interesting insights onto the forefront of the relationship between language and the context in which that language is spoken, be it a uh, first language or second language and so on. And similarly, some work on remote languages are also bringing out newer insights into this relationship and its probable connections. The the, there is no ha hard and fast rule as to what exactly, uh, how, what is the you know the extent of the uh, impact, but there is certainly an amount of interaction that happens. So these insights are um, for are um, found in the uh, following domains. These these are the domains that have that have uh, given us a lot of uh, uh, data 
in terms of um, finding out what is the relationship between these. So, language and space actually has a lot of um, data to offer us in terms of the relationship. However, we will discuss this um, in a separate segment because this is important enough. Um, right now, we will discuss on the gender, number, tense and object categorization primarily and we, we will see how these grammatical um, uh, aspects, how these grammatical um, patterns in languages have some amount of relationship with the way the concepts are actually internalized by the community. So, this, this way of looking at language structure and connecting them with the human thought process, with the way, uh, with the way humans um, create a world view, so to say, is called neo-warfism. So, neo-warfism is a uh, revised and newer version let us say a softer take on the same uh, theory that language has a relationship with our mental um, uh, processing with our uh, cognition. So, the first um, uh, topic, first grammatical aspect that we will discuss is that of grammatical gender. Now, languages differ in terms of grammar whether they have a grammatical gender or not. What does it mean to have a grammatical gender? Some languages in the world assign gender to the to an inanimate object. Of course, animate objects have gender, biological gender, but in cases of some languages, the inanimate objects, objects that are that are not biological entities will also have some amount of some kind of a gender assigned to them. Some languages of this uh, type are French, Spanish, German, Hindi, Punjabi and so on. What does it mean? It means that objects, something like a uh, chair, a table, a fan and a house and so on will have a gender assigned to it. Each of them will be either feminine or masculine. So, for example, in um, German you have uh, this uh, three way differentiation between da, da and das uh, in terms of uh, what we call determiner. In linguistics it is called determiners, it is like the. So, if it is the book, the uh, car and so on that deter the determiner that is the the part of the in German changes depending on the noun to which it, it is prefixed. So, that is how you see das auto. Similarly, in French you have a uh, distinction in terms of uh, determiners. In Hindi, uh, in India, in Hindi language, gender agreement is based is used in both the verb and the adjective and the possessive marker. So, here is an example. So, in Hindi, this the term police as a as a as an entity, not necessarily a policeman or a police woman, but police as an entity as a as a as an abstract uh, uh, category has is uh, treated as feminine. That is how you will see police are gay. This, this part de uh, denotes the feminine gender of the um, entity in this case. So, this is, this is how you have an agreement between the noun and the verb, because it is feminine. Similarly, topi, so this is a possessive, so this is topi is uh, uh, has uh, feminine gender that is how you have meri topi, but if ghar is uh, considered masculine, so it will be mera ghar. So, similarly, so this is how what we mean by the grammatical gender in some languages. Now, neither topi nor uh, police as an abstract entity has a gender in the strictest sense, but this is how the grammatically we assign gender. Now, fine, yes, languages have gender in uh, for inanimate objects, but does it really matter? Why are we even discussing this? The funny thing is that apparently, the gender that we use for certain inanimate objects also has some role to play as to how we look at them. Apparently, we even conceptualize them differently. So, there was a very well known study between um, uh, German and Spanish speakers. Now, the interesting thing about German Spanish uh, pairing is that these two languages assign opposite gender to a same set of nouns. So, the same noun like bridge or keys and so on will have opposite gender in these two languages and that is how it becomes very interesting to see what will how the speakers treat these words. So, uh, the study was uh, carried out on these two different speech communities. There was a list of uh, nouns that were prepared and the subjects were asked to write appropriate adjectives for those words. So, um, like the words included bridge, the, it also had keys and many, it is a long list of nouns. So, bridge 
had got elegant, fragile, slender, beautiful, pretty and so on in German, because in German bridge the noun bridge is feminine. However, the same noun bridge is masculine in Spanish and we had uh, the, the researchers found that the Spanish used adjectives like this in uh, to describe the bridge in Spanish. So, you see typical uh, you can al already see that these adjectives are typically feminine in case of German and typically masculine in, uh, in Spanish. So, one can easily understand the gender of these objects in these two languages is actually having some amount of impact on the way you look at it, because there was no uh, instruction uh, to think in terms of you know either feminine or masculine, they were just asked to give adjectives appropriate adjectives for these nouns and this is how it uh, turns out. Similarly, another study on Arabic and English speakers had similar result when asked about their uh, the subjects to assign a male or female voice to a list of objects. So, if objects that is inanimate objects have a gender assigned to it, we, auto, we tend to think of them in terms of actually having a gender. This is the basic finding of this, um, this uh, set of uh, studies. Now, we move on to the category of number. Um, the category of number also is a very interesting one and uh, it seems to have some impact on the way we uh, conceptualize. So, one interesting aspect uh, in case of grammatical number is the differentiation between the classifier languages and the noun class languages. Now, what is the classifier language? Classifier languages have a particular uh, grammatical entity called classifier that sometimes uh, will prefix be prefixed or sometimes be suffixed to all, uh, all the nouns in that particular language. We will look at classifiers in uh, greater detail in the next segment. Um, so, in case of uh, numeral classifiers, numeral classifiers are those classifiers that are um, suffixed or prefixed to the number in a particular language. So, in classifier languages what happens is that the distinction between count noun and mass noun is often blurred as opposed to languages that are considered noun class languages. So, noun class languages have a possibility of um, having assigning singular versus a plural uh, number to, to, to objects like one book, two books, three books and so on. However, in case of classifier languages, it is possible to use the same, these languages noun typically denote substances, because classifier languages nouns will not talk about the shape and size of the object, but the substance with which it is made and hence it is unbounded and discrete. As a result of which it is possible to use the same, uh, same number marker for both kinds of, uh, both, both kinds of um, um, uh, all kinds of um, uh, numbers, so uh, both singular and plural. So, noun class language for example, now count and mass nouns are treated differently as you see uh, a candle, two candles and there is a marker here, but in case of uh, uncountable mass nouns you have to use a glass of water not one water, but in case of classifier languages it is possible to say a glass of uh, a, a water as well as a book that is the difference and there will be a classifier that will be that will come in the bit in between these two uh, parts of the grammatical aspects. Now, comes the uh, much researched area of tense, tense marking. How, what does tense mark? Tense marks the time uh, at which the action was taken when the verb was um, uh, unfolding. So, some languages in the world do not mark tense in the verb system. In the, in the way, when we say do not mark the tense system, we mean the way we are usually used to seeing them like it is in English. There is a past and present and a future dif distinction, but not all languages follow the same way of um, you know cutting time, continuous time into segments. So, that is what we mean by do not mark tense in the verb system. However, that does not really mean they do not really understand that the difference uh, that there is a difference between uh, these two, these three possibilities. But what happens is, uh, what really happens uh, in these languages is, uh, what is interesting to see is whether this lack of overt marking of tense system, does it look, does it make them look at the object, does it make them look at the event differently. This is what is more interesting to see and one particular study that was, that is very well known, uh, it was carried out on Indonesian languages. So, uh, speakers of these languages may use separate words for 
expressing that particular information, but not use a particular grammatical entity. Like in English, you can say I played versus I will play versus I am playing and so on. This particular distinction is missing in this language. However, there are other ways of um, uh, understanding the context. A particular study was carried out uh, to, uh, to, uh, to ascertain if this lack of grammatical tense marking in Indonesian has a direct impact on the way they look at the event. So, the study went like this, there were photographs now showing people who were either about to perform an action, were performing an action or had finished an action. So, which means that there were people doing something, there was an action depicted in the photographs. However, the actions were divided into three tense, ma tense systems as from our perspective, from perspective of English language. So, about to perform an action meaning it will happen and then that is performing an action, this is present tense and this is past tense. And this is future tense and they all have because these things have corresponding tense in English, but not in Indonesian. So, that was the distinction between these two languages. There was another variable that was brought into the study, which was that this study's action was performed by three different agents. So, there were three different kinds of people doing the same action. In one case, it was uh, people wearing different colored jersey, football jersey, in another, another case, there were different people and so on. So, there were pictures of some action happening. These actions were differentiated on in uh, one on the term of the tense at, at in terms of when the action happened and also the difference was there in terms of the agents who perform these actions. Now, the task was the task that was told to the subjects was to, to put similar pictures together, put similar pictures together. Now, remember there are three possibilities in terms of tense and three possibilities in terms of agents. Indonesian monolinguals more often than not tended to sort the pictures depending on the agents. So, if a person, if the one of the agent is wearing green, another blue and another yellow. So, the differentiation or, or sorting of the cars depended on the uniform, on the dress that, that the person was wearing, the, the football jersey the person was wearing. So, this all the yellow, pic, yellow uh, jersey wearing footballers went into one group and so on. However, interesting aspect was that Indonesian bilinguals who had English as their second language tended to differentiate or sort the pictures like an English speaker would, which is sorting them in terms of the tense that is there that, that would you would use to describe this. So, this was taken as an example of the grammatical system in terms of tense marking affecting the way you, you uh, understand, affecting the way you look at a particular event. Remember the task had nothing to do with language, they only had to sort pictures into se separate groups. There was no clue as to how they are supposed to and depending on how they actually did the task, we derived the conclusion that monolingual Indonesian speakers based on their language that they speak, which does not distinguish overtly between these three types of action, they simply used the agents, the information that they got from the agents as a basis for sorting them. But when, when they have started learning English as a second language and they were influenced by the grammatical um, tense system in English language and they started sorting the cards in terms of um, the, the, the tense. And that was the difference between the monolingual Indonesian and bilingual speakers of Indo uh, in L2 speakers of Indonesian language. Similar or similar differences can be found out in terms of object categorization as well. Object categorization we will again as, as I mentioned earlier, we will talk in greater detail in the next segment when we talk about classifiers. Um, but in short, there are uh, languages de distinguish the, their objects, the nouns in different categories. So, in case uh, in one language you might have only two names for a particular entity, but in another language you might have a much more finer nuanced way of segmenting the same thing. For example, there are 16 objects named bottle in English that are spread across 7 linguistic categories in Spanish, 16 objects that can be called 
simply bottle in English actually span across seven linguistic categories in Spanish. Even in Hindi for example, you have different words for um, things that would largely come under uh, bottle. So, if it is uh, there, are, there is shishi, there is bottle, there is uh, there are many many such uh, categories. So, languages differ in terms of how they segment, how they what they group together, what objects are grouped together to be called by one name, what objects are you know distinguished on the basis of what and so on. So, in Spanish it depends on the material of the of the bottle, the purpose for which it is uh, used and so on. So, that is how you have different names. So, distinguishing factors may be material usage and you know context, people and many things. Sometimes two languages may have translation equivalence, sometimes they do not. Sometimes uh, why, what makes it interesting is that in case of translation equivalence, sometimes the agreement is there in terms of the prototypes of that category. For example, in case of Russian versus English, you see the prototypes they agree. So, there is uh, uh, cups, uh, what is a cup and what is a glass, Russian and English agree on uh, each uh, with each other on this. However, when it comes to the borderline um, uh, members of the same category, there is a lot of disagreement. So, for example, paper container that we all are familiar with any, any, fa any fast food joint or you know coffee shop. Uh, you, you will see what they give is a paper cup and in English we call it a cup, but in Spanish uh, sorry in Russian they will call it a little glass, they will not call it a cup even though it is performing the same function that a cup does that is you know giving you uh, tea or coffee in, but because it is uh, probably because it is dependent on the shape. So, this kind of uh, differences actually make us think on the categorizing principle that is that would be at work here. How why does it suddenly become if the two languages agree broadly agree on the central examples of a category, but they do not agree on the borderline concepts. So, it makes you think about the categorizing principles that are at play across languages which probably is um, dependent on the way the language is structured. Similarly, the concept of time it has been um, studied in detail in fact, the how the um, how speakers of different languages look at time. What is time? Of course, it is a very uh, this actually can take you at a transcendental level of uh, you know understanding and thought, but uh, sticking to real life and uh, mundane life understanding of time also has a lot of differences between uh, let us say for example, English and Chinese. So, Mandarin and English speakers concept of time actually are different. Chinese think tend to think of time in a vertical way, whereas English tends to think English speakers uh, tend to uh, codify this in terms of horizontality. So, this has already been this has already been uh, proved there is a lot of um, uh, research output um, that is available that already has established this. Now, this is dependent on the script the way we write script also. So, language we are not talking only about the grammar of a language, but also the way it is written the way it is spoken and so on. So, language in its entirety. Now, Mandarin Chinese is written vertically and English language and many other languages are written horizontally. But when we write horizontally also we have differences in terms of either writing right to left or writing from left to right. Our conceptualization actually has a lot to do with even the direction of the writing in terms of e even within horizontal uh, plane. Now, how, um, how do we know that this particular way of writing that the way script is arranged in a particular language has an impact on the way they think about time. So, this is um, uh, by the way most of these studies are actually correlational findings and not necessarily causation, not necessarily they show causation. So, this study was carried out on Mandarin speakers uh, and the task was to answer if March precedes April, simple. It is a simple task of answering a question if March comes before April or April comes after March like this. Now, the critical point here was they had another um, another uh, stimulus which is called a prime the which was watching a vertical array of objects as opposed to seeing an horizontal array of objects. So, before the question was asked to them they were they, they, should, they saw uh, an array of objects arranged either horizontally or vertically. Now, 
and they were all they are always randomized. So, the Chinese speakers saw both the horizontal and the vertical array of objects and they had to answer the question. What the findings uh, uh, shows is that if the Chinese speakers saw a vertical array of objects, they answered the question faster as opposed to if they had seen an, a horizontal array of objects. So, this is taken as an example that because they think of time in a vertical way, when they saw a vertical array of objects, they were already aligned to their way of thinking. However, because horizontal array has a you know has a has a ten has a tension with the way time is conceptualized in Mandarin languages uh, Mandarin language that is why they took more time in answering the question. Of course, the opposite was uh, found in the in case of the English speakers. Another experiment showed that the tendency to think of time vertically was related to the age when the Chinese English bilingual subjects started learning English. Now, in the previous study typical Mandarin monolingual speakers will, uh, will be found to be having uh, a vertical understanding of time. But when it comes to a bilingual Chinese speaker who has Chinese any uh, one of the Chinese languages as is L 1 first language and English as L 2 that becomes another interesting domain of study. So, in case of um, Chinese English bilinguals learning English to what extent verticality will impact their understanding of time is actually dependent on the age when they started learning English. So, you see it is a very nuanced um, uh, understanding, a very nuanced way of looking at how, uh, how subtle the differences can be, how subtle um, the impacts of language and how, how when that impact actually works and when it does not work and if it works what is the extent to which. So, there are these findings that uh, that is that shows that age is an important variable in this case uh, in case of uh, learners of second language which is English. It was also found that the English speakers could be trained to think like the Chinese which means that not only learning English for Chinese speakers tends to make them look at time differently or let us say more like an English speaker, but the reverse is also possible. It is not only the Chinese who change, but if the English speakers are trained in a proper way to think like Chinese, even for them the results will be semi similar to the Chinese monolingual speakers or at least first language speakers of Chinese. So, this suggests that though one's language does have an impact on the conceptualization process of the speakers of the speakers of that uh, particular speech community, it is not in a deterministic way, which is uh, that is why we, so we say that this, there is a strong uh, hypothesis, strong relativity hypothesis is not tenable. However, there are proofs of the weaker version in some sense as we see through various experimental studies in today's time. So, fine there seems to be a relationship and seems to be that language does have an impact an amount of impact on uh, cognition, but how does how let us put it in a more structured way. How do we put a structure to it? Let us ask the fundamental question how does then language affect cognition? We have seen in bits and pieces here and there through examples of gender, number, time and so on that there are there are impacts. So, to put it in a in a in a more structured way there are two ways that language um, actually affects cognition. One is the issue of codability. Language um, I have already used the word code in some um, some cases today. So, language basically codes an, Im, uh, an information that is available to us. So, coding information for example, the color terms we may not have in English we have dark blue, sea blue, light blue you know so on and so forth, but in some languages you can have actually a codified term for a particular shade of blue. Uh, what we mean by codified term is that single word um, uh, name. Naming the moment you name a concept it becomes highlighted. So, that is what we mean by codability. So, certain languages have uh, codes for certain concepts and another language may not have the codes for the same concept. Another domain is that of habitual thought. Habitual thought is a very very significant um, aspect of this uh, uh, relationship. This is something we had seen before also um, how it affects. So, what is codability? 
This is an example again from um, uh, a textbook example. So, languages code concept lexically as we had just said that we have words single words for a particular concept. So, in this particular language you see there are so many um, types of um, trees that grew up on the mountain. For us we do not really have uh, any languages that, that we speak, uh, we, if you think probably we do not have such finer nuances of trees growing on the mountain slope having so many different words, single words that denote that understanding. So, this is what we mean by codability. This is codable, these concepts are codable in this language, it, whereas it may not be in another language. So, languages differ as how to how they segment a continuum that is what is basically uh, we refer to as codability. How do we segment the continuum, continuum whether it is continuum of time or continuum of uh, color, continuum of any other uh, such categories. So, that is where languages differ. So, where do you cut it, how do you slice it and which languages uh, uh, do slice, which languages do not, this is where the codability aspect differs. Now, depending on how a language codifies a particular concept, it makes us look at that particular thing in a in a particular way. So, for example, some languages have singularity versus plurality difference as we have just seen in case of noun class versus um, classifier languages. Some languages make a distinction between witnessed and unwitnessed events. So, when we discuss about let us say I say that um, the, um, there was a snake on the main road today in some languages you need to grammatically specify whether I have personally seen the snake on the road or I have heard it from somebody else. This particular uh, factor about be whether it the event was witnessed or unwitnessed personally by the speaker is also grammaticalized in some, ten, la, some languages. Similarly, completed and uncompleted uh, um, uh, non, non uh, actions, visibility, invisibility of objects and so on. There was a distinction, three way distinction between dialectic objects like here and there, this and that. In some Indian languages, there were there were three different um, um, way of you know de um, uh, denoting the objects in terms of proximity. So, this and that and that. So, there were difference between uh, two kinds of that, one is visible and the other is invisible. So, this kind of distinctions are all there in various languages of the world. And it so happens that if the language has a way of codifying certain concepts, we tend to notice them more often. It is not that we do not otherwise know what is happening, but it is simply because it brings it to the foreground, it brings it, it highlights them. So, we tend to notice because we have to speak about them in that particular language. So, if you if you are a man, if you are a speaker of a language that does not really have to use this um, witnessed versus unwitnessed uh, kind of event, you simply are not uh, going to notice that effect uh, or at least you are not going to highlight that aspect. So, that is what we mean by habitual thought. Now, once you have realized that there are categories uh, and their categories are based on features, sometimes they are you know uh, in terms of classical theory they are represented by all the members, in terms of other theories they are uh, represented by the best examples of the category and so on. But one thing remains constant that categories are arranged hierarchically, there is a structure to categories. It is not, uh, there is a very strong, um, there is a very tight knit kind of a structure, taxonomic uh, structure that holds to any category. So, for example, categories like chair and table and sofa are included in a higher, within a higher category and a superordinate category and that is again part of another superordinate category and so on. Similarly, chair can have you know. Um, office chair and um, so many type types of chair, office chair, lounge chair and uh, study chair and so many other types. So, office chair may have revolving chair, non revolving chair and so on. So, there is a taxonomic hierarchy of all the uh, cate conceptual categories. This, the, this leads us to a vertical or hierarchical arrangement. Now, naturally the highest level of any category, uh, categorical organization is the most general at the top and most specific at the bottom. So, for example, if we talk about vehicles, so or let us say talking about the plant world or the animal world, so you will have you know uh, the animal world and then various kinds of animals and so on. So, the highest level is the most general and lowest level is the most specific. So, this is called the taxonomic hierarchy. 
Now, there is something very interesting about taxonomic hierarchy. What happens is that there is a logical inclusion of features. So, the taxonomy and um, the categories at the highest level possess only a small number of features. And as you go down in the in the taxonomy in the hierarchy, you see each at each level there is a at least an amount of or at least one single um, feature more that is added. So, this is an example from a book uh, from uh, from Roger Brown, this is the uh, this could be one particular hierarchy. So, a thing I have a thing in my pocket and then a metal object and then money a dime a 1952 dime and then a particular dime with a scratch. So, as you go even a simple thing like a uh, like a coin any uh, you can have this kind of a uh, this kind of an inclusion of features that go on and on that can go on and on. And this is still here it is fine there is a hierarchy there is a taxonomy and there is a uh, in logical inclusion of features as you go down in the hierarchy. But it seems there is some kind of a superior status of the mid level uh, in the hierarchy superior status as in the there is a some kind of an advantageous position that the mid level always in, enjoys. For example, if you talk about vehicle and then four wheelers and then there is car and then there is you know various kinds of cars let us say a uh, Maruti or a uh, uh, Hyundai or many other cars and then you go uh, as you go uh, further below you can actually specify the model and make and so many other things, but readily we can talk about a car. So, the right now if I hear a noise of a car moving uh, car, uh, crossing the wind crossing under my window, we will not say there is a vehicle that went or we will not even say that this is a you know uh, 2013 model of this and that uh, brand, what we will say there was a car. So, this car is actually the mid level in that entire hierarchy, this is what we mean by a certain amount of advantage that the mid level in the hierarchy enjoys this is called the basic level theory of basic level. So, the mid level is the basic level in case of taxonomic hierarchy of the categories of any category for that matter. So, mid level is psychologically privileged this is the most natural level where we engage. So, that is why because we readily engage with this this, this uh, also enjoys a kind of psychological advantage that is why it is called a uh, that is why it is called a basic level theory. So, typically we would name objects in the lower uh, we will not name at the lower level, but we will always name at the basic level. Of course, there are examples that um, can counter this, but often more often than not we will not. This is also basic in terms of how children learn a category. When children are learning about a category, again we will not they do not learn at the highest level or at the lowest level, the entry point of learning a category is also the mid level. So, why do we mean there, why do we say what we mean by being basic is that they are basic in terms of perception, in terms of action, in terms of uh, communication as well as knowledge. So, this is where we have more uh, connections. So, we have a better idea about an object at the mid level as opposed to both at the highest and the lowest object. Similarly, in terms of action as in how we engage with a particular category. So, you can easily talk about what you do with a car as opposed to what you do with a limo or you know or, uh, what kind of action or as opposed to the to a vehicle and so on. Similarly, communication it is the basic level categories are usually the shortest and learn first and enter the lexicon first also and also used in a neutral context. Knowledge again in terms of knowledge we possess a large amount of knowledge in the uh, about the base, base level as opposed to the higher and the lower, uh, lower uh, levels of the categorization. Now, why do we have basic level categories in the first place? Why what is the why do we even need? The ideas that have been put forward is that we categorize, categorizing is a, is a fundamental principle as we have already seen and this is also a universal uh, process, but we have also seen that this is a process that out that outcome of which is not on, always universal. So, what we do when we categorize is that we are working under two contradictory pressures, contradictory pressures of putting similar things together and putting separate things separate. These are the two 
fun to basic understanding about categorizing. Why do we categorize? We categorize to put similar things together, but also different things separate. So, these are the two contradictory forces that we are talking about here. So, the we want to group together items that appear similar to us and similarly we want to keep separate things separate. So, at the level of chair within the category furniture, we have chairs and that is exactly where the sub categories are different. So, we know what to do with a chair as opposed to what, what to do with a furniture. So, at this level we are differentiating between chairs and tables even though they both are under the same um, superordinate category furniture. So, this distinction we need and that is exactly why basic level categories are um, very important. So, basic level categories take care of this problem. So, because at this level category is maximally different from the neighboring category. So, chairs are different from tables while grouping together items that are maximally similar to one another. So, chair the category chair includes all kinds of chairs which are basically similar to one another. So, that is why basic level categories theory of basic level categories are important uh, is important. So, basic level category as I have just mentioned is not um, the is not the same in, uh, in very different cultures they are different. Now, that when we talk about cultures and categories we actually open a Pandora's box. Cultures and categories are very interesting uh, interaction that we have in terms of various kinds of categories not only in terms of concrete objects, but also in terms of abstract notions. For example, one such category is the category of art. So, people from different different uh, cultures, different uh, speech communities have different ways of looking at the same object. So, as a result of which categories vary. If we look at the category of art for example, or you can take music or even simple things like freedom and uh, uh, um, you know what is what is freedom something like something as simple as that we would actually start looking at how it is categorized across cultures will actually leave us uh, you know dumbfounded. The, the, the differences at the level of at the basic level as well as at various other levels are uh, very interesting to, uh, to, to look at. So, if coming back to art the category of art how do we define art? If you go to you know uh, dictionaries and other uh, sources of information these are some of the uh, definitions that you might encounter. So, what we see on display in art museum is a very rudimentary very basic um, uh, definition of art, but it is not a good definition because it only limits art to a visible product right which is the end of a process. So, primary focus is on what people think it is. On the other hand if you go to encyclopedia you will see a combination of skills and imagination in the creation of objects, environment experiences so on and so forth. By this definition even some sports and games will also qualify to be called art like figure skating. We can go on and on there are various kinds of um, various definitions th that are available from various sources and you see each definition highlights one particular aspect of that category art. If somebody in if somebody is um, uh, highlighting the skill, somebody else is highlighting the output, somebody else is highlighting the material, somebody else is highlighting the object of art and so on and so forth. And because of this art as a category has also gone through a lot of changes across time, across space and time. So, does it mean that categories like art or music or many other such things have any essential feature to talk about? Is it possible that certain categories do not even have what we have started with essential necessary and sufficient conditions? This is what we will see shortly. These are only a few names, only very, very few uh, schools of thought or you can say types of art are practiced over, over time. So, impressionism to symbolism to cubism that is no I have not put them in any order uh, in, in, in any chronological order it is just that there are all these possibilities. So, um, impressionism symbolism say and to then this is a later form art abstract art conceptual art these are later forms of art whereas, these are older. Similarly, um, so how do they differ? There are only I have only added a few here, but there are so many more. How do these various schools of art differ? They differ in terms of 
what is to be painted, how it is to be painted, how is the message of the painting to be delivered to the audience and so on. So, basic how do you then talk about basic features of a category like art? How do you how do you how do you arrive at it? So, basic features of art that has you know they are actually called movements across time, because many of these uh, schools of thought actually came out as a revolt against the previously held standpoint as to how art should be. So, when art was essentially indoor activity in the old times and uh, gradually it came out of uh, you know in the outdoors that was a movement that was almost a revolution at that time, similarly in terms of uh, how to paint and so on. So, let us turn to the assumed feature of one view and then a movement that cancel them. So, for example, in in the in the in case of impressionism, expressionism, and surrealism, the idea was to represent an objective reality, something that is there, that is out there. You just express it. Now, this was cancelled by uh, this was uh, cancelled by impression. Uh, sorry, the initial idea was that. Uh, art should uh, represent an objective reality. In the olden times, the paintings would represent uh, religious figures or noblemen, kings and queens and so on. Later on, there was a change by using impressionism, whereas the there is no directly perceivable objective reality that is present. Similarly, surrealism. Similarly, you can see so many types of um, uh, thoughts that were there and then this was cancelled by another. So, if you look at symbolism for example, objective and rational thought is cancelled. Similarly, natural figures and forms if uh, if you are familiar if uh, if you look at uh, Picasso's painting for example, figures are all for a lay person they are all distorted, but for Picasso they are of course, uh, perfectly and art lovers and uh, connoisseurs of art they are perfectly uh, fine. So, this idea that one has to represent a figure as it should be a human as, as the human really looks was cancelled by so this is something uh, fundamental a human should look like a human in a painting, but in a representation, but that does not. So, this is uh, this is cancelled similarly canonical activities are how you paint that has also been uh, cancelled. So, there are all these possibilities to the extent that sometimes uh, you know the what is called art in today's time will ha has come so far away from what was called art let us say few centuries back it is really really astonishing. So, materials as I said in terms of material in terms of who the target audience is in the initial uh, phases in the old times art was considered to be for the elite now it is cancelled by pop art and so on the themes and uh, you know purpose and so on physical objects everything has been cancelled. So, there is absolutely no fundamental feature of what an art is basically that is the point. So, if you look at these two um, types of um, you know output of art the one on the left is Picasso's uh, uh, self portrait facing death this is what he painted just before his death and um, the on the other side you have th this is um, the very famous pen uh, it's not called it, it's not called a painting it is uh, sort of an installation so there is a picture of a chair this is the name of the work is um, three chairs by joseph kosuth and he calls it uh, so there is a chair there is a real chair and there is a picture of a chair and there is a dictionary definition of what a chair is. Now, this is also called art. Now, if you consider these two there is no similarity either in terms of you know uh, material in terms of how the output is, what the display is and how is the person who is you know uh, who is considered the artist, how what is the type of engagement, what is the material used and so on there is absolutely no similarity. And this is they are not so far removed in time as like you know if you look at uh, Monet or you know even older uh, uh, Vermeer or other painters. So, if a category like art which is an abstract category uh, can have so many movements that changes even the fundamental understanding of what the category should represent what the category is then how do we say that categories are stable mental representation. Remember we started with the definition that categories are stable mental representation of a concept. 
this is fine as a uh, when it uh, comes to ob um, objects that are you know tangible objects that are concrete chairs and tables however designer the chair becomes it still remains a chair to uh, to the onlooker but if you if you turn to abstract notions like art music uh, and many other uh, such notions you will see the very idea fundamental idea that a concept must have a set of features that define them this is completely um, denied by such kind of categories. So, we can conclude that even the definitional aspects of a category can be challenged. So, in the initial part in the first part we saw that the representative members of a category can change dependent on the culture, dependent on the language and so on. So, that is not the, not all members of a category are same they can be they can change and there is a gradation. Then we saw that this particular understanding of prototype can change depending on the culture. Now, we see even the basic features which are supposed to be represented by the central members can also be contested, they are also not stable. So, prototypes are also changeable. What does that leave us with? That leaves us with the fact that categorization as a fundamental mental process is open to a lot of changes, possible changes across time and across space and languages and cultures. Even though the process is fundamental to humans, the end result is not, this is changeable. So, how do we take care of our concept then? Do we, how do we keep a hold on how do we understand things in the world? We probably need a new theory. Theories of categorization in terms of features probably are not tenable. We will look at this question, we will take this question up in the next module. This is the reading material for uh, references for this particular segment for this module. Uh, you can there are uh, some most of the important um, this particular book by George Lakoff is, is the book that I have primarily followed for this module but then there are others also which are extremely important. So, you can uh, all of them can be uh, uh, looked at. So, Berlin and Brent I have of, I have already referred to and so on. Some more recent works here and Lira Borodisky of course, because of her work on grammar the affecting the way we think. Thank you.